Welcome to the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast, where we interview the world's leading CEOs, business executives, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and authors. Our mission is to learn the strategies and tactics that have helped our guests succeed in business and life and share those lessons with you so that you can become the Bulletproof Entrepreneur. My name is Chia Dogu, and I'm the co-founder and COO of Dogu Media Group. Dogu Media Group is a podcast marketing and new media agency that helps corporations create and amplify their story via high-quality branded audio content that builds a community of highly engaged fans who are their ideal clients for their premium products and services. And now, without further ado, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting edition of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Ramya Mariel L. Agami. Maria is the editor in chief of Tarawat Magazine, the global publication for family businesses. She started the magazine with her family a couple years ago after they pivoted from their original business. She also runs Orbis Terra Media, a content studio enabling brands to achieve narrative consistency across multiple platforms. She's studied, lived, and worked in Dubai, the UAE, the Middle East, and she currently lives in Switzerland. She has a very highly international background. So I'm pleased to have Ramia today to come and tell us a little bit more about herself, but not necessarily more of herself, but more about her business strategies and tactics to overcome obstacles. Because as of recording right now, we're all feeling the pinch of the COVID-19 crisis around the world, and it has literally decimated businesses across the globe. So I know that if you're listening to this and the premise of the show is the Bulletproof Entrepreneur, yes, you're, you're going to expect that troubles are going to come, obstacles are going to come. You're looking for tools to learn how to circumvent, navigate, and overcome those obstacles. So this is going to pivot more towards how to get rid of some of the, or overcome some of the challenges that are currently facing you in your business or even in your personal life, because business and personal usually mix a lot. So I'm pleased to have Ramya on the show today, and we're going to dive real deep into some how-tos to help small businesses survive and thrive during this crisis. So with that said, Ramya, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, and, and what an introduction. I'll try to live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be fun. Yes, let's get some practical advice going here in this very difficult time. Awesome. So Ramya, before we get into all that, now let's just talk a little bit about yourself and your background. So give us the quick Cliff notes about you. Where did you come from? How did you get into the industry? And what are you currently doing today? Uh, so very short version, I would say we are, um, just to explain the cultural background, and I guess why we sound a little bit uh, international, is we are of Dutch-Egyptian origin. My father's Egyptian, my mom's Dutch. We were born and raised in Switzerland. We were uh, a typical immigrant entrepreneurial family, I would say. My dad built his own business up. We then joined, span off new businesses, amongst others. We started a publishing firm, and that publishing firm was built around building Tharawat Magazine, which you just mentioned, which is one of the leading publications in the world right now on the topic of family businesses and multi-generational entrepreneurship. So I've been the editor-in-chief of that for, for 12 years now, almost. And we built a larger content marketing and content production studio around that brand and now are basically helping brands achieve growth through content marketing and content production around the world and across platforms and all sorts of formats. So we're hugely invested in helping companies and individuals understand how powerful content is in unlocking all your objectives in the business and in your marketing goals. And so it's it's been a very rewarding journey to see how when you present the power of content and the power of content and how it can bring new data, it can help you bring your narrative across, but also it can impact people very positively. You know, I think to, to bring that effect closer to people has been a very beautiful journey for us. And so, yeah, so that's why we're active and we're still a family business. My, my family runs multiple businesses. I work with my sisters. So, yes, yeah, so I'm living I'm living the thing that we also talk about in our magazine very much. So I know what I'm talking about when it's about working with families. So, so yeah, so that's us really. Like, you know, we're just, we're just hustling, Chi. Like, you know, we're just, we're just doing our best here. And I think it's so nice that you're 
podcast is called Bulletproof. But then again, I think right now we're all feeling the bullets really literally, <laughs> yeah, literally. literally penetrating the vest. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's like you know, there's blood everywhere. So it's like it's, it's been it's been an interesting few weeks to say the least. You're absolutely oh, right for, sure. for that. Yeah. For sure. And you just mentioned that you've been doing the Tarawat magazine for about 12 years or so. So that would actually take us back towards 2008, 2009 and that financial crisis. So given you've lived through one particular financial crisis and we're now living into a mega crisis, so to speak, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what were some of the obstacles you guys had to overcome during those days? And, you know, how did you structure your business to weather that storm? And what are some lessons we can now start applying in this current um, environment? So it's a very interesting question. I think that, of course, it's it's a slightly different approach to what makes you start a business at a given time and then how you adapt an existing business to these kinds of circumstances. I want to be clear about that because, you know, when you start a business, there's always a certain amount of hubris. Like there's always a certain amount of like, you know, invincibility attached to it. Obviously, an entrepreneur will always believe that he or she has something to add that nobody else has thought of. And that's what that's what makes us jump into it. Right. Like in the first place, because we believe otherwise you don't do it. So I think for, for us, it was like um, in 2008, it was really just that. It was just like this combination of naive naivete and at the same time, uh, at the same time, enthusiasm. And at the same time, the financial crisis gave everyone that feeling of there's actually not much to lose in these kind of circumstances. So for us, it made that risk of doing something new and that willingness to do something new made it easier, I guess, to take that risk because... Between us, Chi, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think as a millennial, people talking to me about financial crises doesn't really impress me that much because I literally have never worked in an economy that's been healthy. Like, you know, since the day I've graduated from university, I've only been in one recession after another in one part of the world or another. So that does not really bother me as much because that's pretty much become the norm. I think what's now sort of like the the thing that I hope that people realize they have to tone and what's helped us survive throughout different, various different challenges and, and different upheavals uh, that we've been through over the last few years, including, you know, being active in regions that have wars and civil unrest and that kind of stuff, which is also, you know, other kinds of dimensions that can cause this kind of disruption. I think it's about letting go of certain expectations. I think where we can go wrong right now as entrepreneurs is I don't think that there's a future anymore for this sort of like set expectation of this is what a successful business looks like. So we're definitely now coming to that point where it's a very big mindset shift. So we're going to probably go towards a point where we truly have to embrace the fact that the most successful business is not going to be the one with the biggest building and the hugest number of entrepreneur like uh, employees, but the most successful business is going to be the most relevant one, probably the one that has the most data that is relevant to the largest audience, and that is the leanest and the most flexible in adapting to new circumstances. Because, and I think that's a real departure from how we used to be taught to define success, right? Like if you think about it, our generation at least was still really taught to belief that, you know, the bigger the name on the on the building, the bigger the building, the more the more people you employ, you've made it. That that's success. Like it's very quantitative. It's very physical. You know what I mean? And I think we're really departing from that. I really think that how we value businesses and how we value how we define success is has to shift because circumstances don't allow for this anymore. And I think this current crisis is bringing that home very forcefully where, you know, you have to really say like, you know, for instance, for us, we've been working remotely for the last seven years. And we so, I so appreciate that this is so hard for people who've had to do this from one day to the next, because that's not an easy cultural change. That is not an easy cultural change. And yet we might be faced with a reality even post pandemic that makes these kinds of circumstances a requirement, right? Like, and so I think so that again, it's going to just mean a real shift. And that sort of 21st century feeling, that fourth industrial revolution feeling is really, really taking root now. And so there's no going back from that. I think this is what this is bringing home 
in a massive way, right? Like, so I would say those are, those are my first sort of like impressions. And as far as we can say anything at this point, because we're, of course, things are still unfolding. And, uh, and you, we, we also have to still see if we're going to make it through at the moment It's looking good because we are in a, in a category that's highly relevant at this stage, but, but still, right? Like, I think this is the biggest obstacle to people surviving these kinds of circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so now in terms of your business, you're in the content space and the content uh, marketing and media space, of obviously. So now I know that looking across the spectrum of the globe, you know, big brands are cutting budgets, probably co- companies are cutting budgets, first and right? And usually the first thing they try to cut is always marketing. But given a crisis of this magnitude, for example, small businesses will try and cut back on expenses and whatnot. What do you think or how should cut small businesses or small entrepreneurs start to position themselves or create content or do things to weather the storm? And, and, so in other words, you put on your consulting hat and say, okay, probably people are not going to hire Tara Watt. I hope they do, but I'm just saying hypothetically. But okay, if you're not going to hire us, these are some things that you can implement sure. yourself. And uh, I totally agree with you. And I think like, you know, this one of the best parts of our job is really that like, you know, you can do it with us, but you can, when you when you do certain things, you can also totally do it without us. Like, you know, there's definitely the whole point for us is also to convince people to eventually invest so much in their own uh, content marketing that they're, they they can do it on their own, right? Like, so that's the whole purpose here is to unlock that potential in companies and in brands. So very, very pragmatically speaking, I think like first few things to, to consider is like, you know, do not cut back on marketing at all, right? I think this is like, this is not that crisis, it's not that crisis. Like if anything, cut back on everything else except that. Because the most important thing to understand right now is that in a time where fear is huge on everyone's radar and uncertainty is absolutely, is I would say uncertainty is higher than it was in 2008. And that's saying something. Sure. Higher sure. and wider spread, right? Like, and that's saying something for people who've been through 2008. We know what we're talking about. That was tough. That because was at least nations didn't close borders, airlines were not grounded, you know, people were not forced to stay indoors, things were still going on. Gee, people weren't dying every single yeah. day. Like, you know, we literally are seeing people dying from this every single day at the globe. So this is the first time that there's this universal problem, right? Like you have to realize that today, no matter how big your business is or what it is that you do, if you understand that you have an opportunity here to position yourself towards your customers, towards your stakeholders as a voice of reason, a reassurance, and to use your channels to do that, then you can come out of this, like not triumphant, but at least successfully. Because I think what's the worst part right now, and and actually there's a lot of, I'm not the only one who's saying this, like there's a lot of industry experts saying that right now. The worst part that a brand, the worst thing that a brand or a company can do right now is to go quiet. I mean, as much as nobody should engage in fake news or like fake statistics and stuff like that, stay in your lane, talk about what you know, but talk about it. Give reassurance, give your own perspective, preempt the conversation like you know it's almost like own the narrative because in in this kind of situation the narrative gets away from you because you know people just stuff goes on in their minds and stuff like that and it's it's very hard to control and emotions are running very high for brands this is not the moment to divest from marketing for brands this is the moment to strengthen their channels especially the digital ones which now i think you know it's very clear why you need digital digital channels, strong digital channels. Invest, double up on it, and understand that people's sphere of reality has changed right now. It's become restricted. There's less mobility. So you need to give them inspiration, information, and consistency if you want your brand to remain a consideration after the worst of the crisis is over. If you go quiet, you will be forgotten. If you look like you're profiteering, you will be negatively associated with it. So it's really about finding that tone. My advice is stay in your lane. So stick to what you're good at, but acknowledge the situation and preempt it. So don't wait until your clients come to you and ask you, are you going to be operating? Are you going to be okay? No, you go out first 
you preempt it, you tell them, I empathize, I understand that you must be going through this now. We understand what this might be. Offer discounts before they can cancel. You know, preempt the strikes because this is the thing, like waiting and hoping that it won't happen is useless because it will. They, they're not going to cut their budgets. Literally, their revenues are going to diminish, which means that they can't. It's not about them cutting you. It's about them not being able to afford you, which is a huge difference. It's a huge difference, right? And if you as a service provider or as anyone who like, you know, is in service or in product, if you don't acknowledge that difficulty on your client's side, and if you don't preempt it, and if you don't show that you're going to do everything you can to safeguard what really matters, which is the relationship with the client, then you're going to lose. So safeguard the relationship because that's what's going to outlast this. Because even if you will find yourself in a situation in which many of us will, and I, I have absolutely no intention of making this look rosier than it is, even if many of us will find ourselves in a situation where we might have to shut down what we were originally doing, we might have to scale down. We might have to fire people. We might have to. We're really, many of us are going to go are going to go through severe financial duress. That's a fact. Then I don't want to talk that down at all. However, the one thing that is guaranteed to get you out of it again at the other end are the relationships that you've managed to keep. So keep them, invest in them. Don't cut down on your comms and on your marketing because this is not the time to go quiet. You know what I mean? So this is this would be like sort of my first, like my, my clear sort of like double up on content creation, double up on communication, double up on empathy, huge amounts of empathy deployment. This is the time for you to truly show that you're able to understand your client's needs, to understand what they're going through and to put that into words that make everyone feel comforted and understood. This is that is marketing at its finest always, but particularly now, particularly now. Now, let's speak on that a little bit more. What does it mean to double down on empathy and deploying more empathy? Is it about talking about the situation? Is it about, like you said, offering discounts beforehand? Because sometimes people are like, okay, I want to post this and I want to seem empathetic, but it also at the same time, people know I'm in business, so people might actually have that mindset of, hey, maybe they're posting this because they're trying to sell me this on the other end of it. So how does one frame their voice in such a challenging time where they, yes, they are acknowledging the situation, but also at the same time, they're stepping in front of it. They're putting their voices out. They're making sure they're consistent and they're being heard so that at least people now say, okay, well, should I want to work with this person? I know this person has shown up day in, day out, and he's the person or she's the person I should work with. So it's an interesting one, right? Like, So I personally am of the conviction considering how much content I consume for my clients, but also personally, when you tell the truth, people can tell. So it's also a little bit about questioning yourself, right? Are you really coming from, a, from an authentic place with this? Are you authentic about it? If you are mostly worried about yourself right now, that is, you know, Chi, that is fair. That is understandable. But then be fair in what you're saying. Be almost like straight, like, you know, we're being straight with people, never hurt anyone. Like, you know what I mean? It's really just, it's about being, don't pretend that you're dealing with the situation if you're not, you know, don't pretend that you're like, you know, that you're telling other people how to over, overcome the struggle if you're not. I think this is really important. So the authenticity game is, is real and it's only, it can only be challenged. So this is a challenge for us on the personal development level. Okay. As entrepreneurs, this is a stress test of how honest are you with yourself? If you, this is a moment, this is one of those moments of hardcore leadership tests, honestly, to you. like, you know, this is the moment where you're going to, you're going to see if you can, if you can stand up now and speak to your community, putting your vulnerability out there, acknowledging theirs and finding healing in that business will follow because that's always the consequence of that. Even in times of crisis, yeah, you might not make the volumes that you want. You might not, it might not be in the business that you initially started, for instance, but it might open up opportunities. Again, it's about like, how can you build any kind of relationship that lasts without being truly honest and authentic with the other person? It's the same thing like in any human relationship, right? Like, so for me, look, everybody knows that we all still have to make money, right? 
but you have to make sure that you show that you're not tone deaf to what's going on. You're allowed to still put a price tag on things, G. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. Everyone knows we have to somehow sustain, but you can do it by being honest about it and say like, hey guys, you know, we still have to charge for this, but you know what? We're understanding that this is harder for everyone to afford right now. So we're definitely putting up a discount right now because we want everyone to feel good about it. If you feel like it still comes off as profiteering, make sure you slap a video on there with the founder talking straight into the camera and saying like, guys, we get it. We feel you. It's very hard for someone to look straight like this into a camera and not come across as like meaning well or like meaning what they're saying, right? Like, so I think this is the kind of stuff that you can do. But of course, I can't make people more honest than they are. Like it's either it really comes from that place or it doesn't. If it doesn't come from that place, eventually you're probably going to be found out and you're going to face some backlash, right? Like, so I think, I think that's the thing. Making money today is no worse than making money like, you know, before it has started. It's just that, you know, you just have to be careful and adapt the narrative to the circumstances and understand that it is very hard for you today to claim that people at any given moment in time in the day need to have you as a priority in their minds because there are other very big priorities that have just taken you know, I've just taken taken upper hand, basically. So that's what I would sort of say. Mm. And when it comes to your niche, which is working with family businesses, over the years, how do you think family businesses have weathered significant storms across history? And how do you think they are positioned to weather and ride out the storms? And are there lessons that you can see? So I just did a very interesting podcast with an author of a book uh, who, who talked to a hundred families that have lasted more than three or four generations. And, and he and also the hundreds of family businesses that I've interviewed over the years, there's a few common denominators, right? Like it's a little bit what I've just said right now in the small scale, in the bigger scale as well. Like family businesses that are successful are those that are true to purposes that are bigger than financial gain. It's just the fact like it's because they, it gets them incredible loyalty from their environment. It gets them incredible, like, you know, uh, stamina through times where they might have to cut back on their own wealth or their own benefits and everything. So there's the values and the purpose side, you know, that really is just overarching. The other thing that I think makes family businesses successful, potentially successful in these situations. Not all of them, of course, are going to make it at all because some of them are very uh, anchored in traditions and will not be able to make the quick changes that are necessary now. But technically, one of the biggest reasons why family businesses can survive these kinds of circumstances is because they organically have a next generation that's interested in the, in the survival of the business. Right? This is what non-family businesses struggle with. You don't necessarily have the emotional commitment it might take to survive this, you know, you might just close the business and a family business for a family business to close, you'd really have to have a next generation that has absolutely no interest at all or the circumstances being so dire that, you know, it really doesn't make any sense anymore. You have an, you have an innate next generation that is interested. And right now, for instance, that's very important, right? That because I'm not saying that youth necessarily equates innovation or that youth necessarily equates the solution to this, but youth equates into energy. Now, even though they might not have the solution, they have the energy and energy in these kinds of circumstances is very important. And also in other kinds of circumstances, so family business survives wars and all of these things. When you have youth on your side, you have energy and that energy right now is really required because you don't know how long you're going to have to stay this course. Right. That's another thing. And then I just think like, you know, and this is not just family business, it's just generally like it's like. No, particularly family businesses, maybe. I think the family businesses that have been successful throughout these things is the ones that have allowed themselves to understand that success will look differently in every generation. And this is, again, what I said at the beginning of this conversation. If today you are unable to accept that your definition of success might have to be adapted to the circumstances, you, you're going to have a very hard time. Because you might have to accept that, you know, that successful business that you had in mind is going to have to take a totally different shape. And it's not going to be measured by the same parameters. And it might not even be in the same industry, for heaven's sakes. Like we're talking about whole industries being, you know, disrupted and shut down by this. So I think if you're unwilling to let go of that, then you're going to have a very hard time ahead. And, and I think many family businesses that are still here today after four or five generations, it's because they were able to accept that, you know, it was time to 
adapt, adopt and redefine themselves and, and not feel that this would like hurt their identity or not feel like this means failure. Like, you know, that sense of failure that people get by thinking that adapting to circumstances is necessarily bad. It's not. It's actually it's actually the innately entrepreneurial thing to do, to be honest with you, you know. So um, so, yeah, so that's what I would say that that's what it comes down to, essentially. So basically keeping your culture and your values intact. So so think of so if you're listening to this substitute family business for you, the entrepreneur, keep your values and your beliefs intact, but also evolve your businesses from what you're currently doing to what you see the market needs and then make that. So take, for example, I think um, something like the biggest thing in my mind is Goldman Sachs. I think they started out selling bread or butcher shop or something back in the 1800s. They now started selling stocks on the street before now they're an international bank and they're still going to evolve. So whatever example you can find, that's the only one that comes to my mind, but <laughs> you have to it like that, you know? Think of I, yourself. I ethically disagree, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I need to bleep this out. Like, but I know, what you, I know what you mean in terms of, you're right, in terms of yeah. what the point point made in terms of the adapt, adaptability. Adaptability, well. yes, yeah. adaptability. Unfortunately, yeah. that's the only idea. But I think, you know, I think what you're saying is so important, Shia, but I think it also goes deeper than that. I think that, you know, I was thinking about pride in entrepreneurship a lot over the last few weeks, how um, we're a very special breed, aren't we, entrepreneurs? Like, because it's really not for everyone. It really isn't. Right now, it's probably a good thing to be because we're, we're trained to think on our feet. It's very, This is very tough on people who are employed. This is just, you have to just admit that this is very tough on people who are employed, people who've learned one job or who are like, you know, professionals in one area and that area falls flat or goes the goes numb. And this is very tough. And also for everyone in the gig economy, very, very tough. Entrepreneurs, as we define them, of course, like, you know, we in a way, I guess, like we're supposedly now resourceful, right? Like we're supposedly the ones who are supposed to be able to make, you know, lemonade out of these lemons that have been dealt. And there are a lot of lemons. I will admit that this is a, a lot of lemons. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, admittedly, the more lemonade we can make. But I think that for that, we have this culture of pride. And I think there's this culture of like, you know, maybe stubbornness that comes with entrepreneurship that now can be very dangerous, right? Like, because now is the time for everyone to put their ego aside very definitively, and to understand that, you know, you got to ask for help. You got to ask for advice because this is unprecedented for everyone. Like, I'd be like, gee, like, I, I think it would be so hypocritical of me to sit here and to tell you, oh, we've got this figured out. We've got this path. Like, you know, I'm giving you advice and I know it's going to work out. I don't know. I can tell you what we're practicing and what we're sticking to and what we're trying, what we believe has worked out for others. But to have the arrogance and the presumption to say that we know what's what and that this is what's good, that, that's that's not how this is going to work, right? So there's this notion of like, just understand that that solopreneur, that solo leadership, that is out of the window. You need, as an entrepreneur, surround yourself with competent people now more than ever, whether they're working for you or not. Just have these conversations, these hard conversations. Let other people challenge your model now, please. Because now is the time for you to listen to reason, right? Like this is not the time to like, you know, I mean, stubborn sounds negative. Like, I mean, there's a there, there's this sense of like, you know, we have stamina, of course, as entrepreneurs. Like, you know, we steer the course, we hold on, we like, you know, we can do it, we make sacrifices. That's great. But this kind of circumstance requires us to ask a lot of questions that sometimes we don't like to ask. Like, for instance, do I still have a viable business in the next few years? Do I, and the thing is, the make or break right now is like, how long do you hold on to things that are not going to work anymore? And if you don't listen to other people right now, if you don't let other people in and look at things and just like, you know, question it and, and reform it, if you don't allow that, you're going to stagnate and it's not going to work, right? Like, because it's, it's such an unprecedented situation for everyone that we all have to make sense of it. And to be honest with you, Chi, it's a little bit like, you know, we're, we're publishing, we started in publishing, majorly, dis probably the most disrupted industry in the world. And we found a way to make the magazine successful by our standards, if you will, but I keep on telling people, people ask me to give presentations about this, like, how did you do it? And so I said, like, you know what? 
if in 15 years we are where I th hope we are going to be, that's when I'll allow myself to tell you, I think we did the right thing today. Because time will tell. Time will tell. Right now, it's very hard for anyone to say, this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing. It's very hard to tell, right? So this is, so it's not the time to have these like universal, this is, this is what you should do. These are the strategies you should have. This is not the time. Like the time is now to be humble and to think that, you know, to consider many different scenarios and to be flexible. Mm. As we start to round up, I'll give us some words of wisdom or advice in terms of how to be adaptable. So somebody listening to this podcast and their publisher, whether they're a content writer, digital marketer, podcaster, or whatever, how can we change our mindset and adapt? So I know you're not going to say, hey, do this, do this, do this, like you just mentioned now, but like give us some things or tools we can use to help us with our frame of reference, our thinking and our understanding so that we can start adapting to the situation. Well, I've always found a, a wide field of interest to be very helpful. I'll tell you why, because I think that the danger of any job or, or business is that you start thinking and living in silos because that's your comfort zone. You know, you're, you're important in that silo. You are important to the people in that silo. You meet your peers and you agree with them on everything. And I think that an important part of evolving our thinking and our making ourselves more like, you know, likely to succeed under these circumstances is to challenge ourselves out of our intellectual and physical comfort zones. And I think that that means to consume content from different areas, to really like, you know, go out of our own discipline and go check out what's happening in others. I personally think, please, 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 everyone take a huge interest in technology at a really deep level, not just in your area. Try to understand what is about to happen and how this is going to influence our society. And I think that this is a really important thing for people to consider is that there's actually a lot of educating that we need to do as a society. And especially, especially if you're in the business of marketing, if you're in the business of marketing, I literally, this is one thing I almost stipulate as an imperative. You want to be a marketer. You need to understand where society is going as a whole. You need to understand how people's lives are about to change, how, how their opportunities are about to change or grow or decrease. If you don't understand that, how on earth are you, do you think you're going to be able to have a conversation with your clientele, with your audience? It's not possible. So I think a wider spectrum of interest, I think we're too narrow in our interests. Like, you know, as, as, a, as a too narrow, we're just too like, you know, oh, okay, I'm, I'm very good at this and that's where I'm going to stay. No, go out there, challenge yourself. Like I've been telling people even at simple things right now, like I tell people, you know, even just something as simple to you as like, you know what, take that extra time that you have because you do have that extra hour that normally you would be using to commute. You do like, you know, it, even if you have the kids at home right now, you do have that, that extra hour that you would be spending in the car or spending in line or something, you have it. Use it, like use it, like do anything that's different for your brain. Learn a language, do a webinar in an area that you have no clue about. Humble yourself into change, basically. That's what I think is very important right now. I love that. I think I'm going to put that on a shirt. Humble yourself into change. <laughs> Awesome. Ramya, thanks so much for coming to share your words of wisdom to help us as entrepreneurs navigate these um, challenging times. But before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about where people can connect with you, where they can find your podcast, where they can read your magazine and everything else you've got going on. <laughs> Well, in good old content marketer fashion, you can find me everywhere, of course. Gee. <laughs> it's hard to not find me <laughs> unless you don't know how to spell my name, which is very likely. So maybe just type that out on, on the at the bottom of the podcast episode. So obviously, like uh, our magazine is uh, sarawat-magazine.com. And it's like a really great resource for 
people who have family businesses or entrepreneurs who definitely want to think long term. Uh, it's all about that. Then we have uh, where we have a podcast as well. It's easy to access, which is called the Family Business Voice, which I hope everyone will enjoy. It's really great conversations with business leaders. OTM or pisteramedia.com, well, you'll find our website there. We also have a blog, which is quite rich, and we're about to start a podcast there too. So that's going to be fun where we're going to talk with different marketers around the world about their strategies. So yeah, so we're always busy. Me, you can find me on all the social media. Like, you know, as I said, like I'll never, um, never stop creating content and never stop having opinions, whether they be adequate or not about everything. So it's hard to miss me. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter by just typing in my name. It's easy. It pops up because there are not many people who have such a weird name. So there you go. It's a good, good branding tool. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. So I'll be sure to make um, a note to that and link to that. Every every resource you've mentioned and everywhere we can find you in the show notes once this goes live. So thanks a lot for coming to share your story and, of course, even more importantly, to teach us how to navigate these challenging times. Thanks, Chi. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in once again to the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. If you like what you heard on today's episode of the show, please go to iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And it tells me if I'm doing a good job or not and what type of guests to bring that can impart solid wisdom to help you grow on your entrepreneurial journey. Once again, you can always email me at info at odogwu.com. That's info at odogwu.com to let me know you know if you want a different type of guest or if you even want to be considered as a guest on the show so till next time guys have a great day stay bulletproof and of course i'll catch you on the next episode of the bulletproof entrepreneur podcast <laughs>